<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, uh, I seem to always be interrupting your meal, and I apologize for that. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, most of you are just uh, continuing to sample the dessert bar uh, at the Thomas Center. Uh, but I do want to get us uh, uh, started on this program again so that we'll have the opportunity to have time for questions and answers from our guest speaker. Uh, we're really fortunate uh, to have a very busy person joining <laughs> us today. He flew in this morning. Uh, Paul Rosenzweig is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy in the Department of Homeland Security. He has responsibility for developing policy, strategic plans, and uh, international approaches, kind of going back to what we were talking about yesterday afternoon, to the entire gamut of homeland security activities, ranging from immigration and border security to avian flu and international data protection. He's also an adjunct professor of law at George Mason University School of Law, judge, and serves on the editorial board of the Journal of National Security Law and Policy, which is basically published by the uh, uh, out there by uh, Elizabeth Renskall Parker, a mutual friend of many of ours. Uh, and he is a member of the board of advisors for the Hanover College Center for Free Inquiry. Prior to joining the department, Mr. Rosenzweig served as a senior legal research fellow in the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation, where his research interests focused on issues of civil liberties and national security and criminal law. He also served as a trial attorney in the environmental crime section of the Department of Justice as investigative counsel to the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and as a senior litigation counsel in the Office of the Independent Counsel. He's a cum laude graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. He has a Master of Science in Chemical Oceanograph Ocean Oceanography. Oceanography. The water. <laughs> Being like John, I've been up too long. From Scripps Institute, which is a lovely place on the West Coast. And a BA from Haverford College. Following graduation from law school, he served as a law clerk to the Honorable R. Lanier Anderson of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. He's the co-author of the book Winning the Long War, Lessons from the Cold War for Defeating Terrorism and Preserving Freedom, and the co-editor of the forthcoming book. Um, when is it going to be coming out, Paul? It's supposed to be out this year. Out it's this supposed year. supposed to be out last year. So. <laughs> Somewhat delayed forthcoming book, One Nation Under Arrest, How Crazy Laws, Rogue Prosecutors, and Lazy Judges threaten our liberty. And uh, you better come up so you get a far from Judge Sintel. Paul Rosenzweig, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, uh, that book has been delayed, um, and I'm sure that now Judge Sintel is going to enjoy its publication, so it'll never be out. Uh, thank you very, very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to do something, I think, a little dangerous today. Uh, I brought with me the speech that the staff wrote, which would have been very dull. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, I spent last night trying to think of more interesting things to say to you, and I hope, uh, I hope to uh, educate you a little bit on the Department of Homeland Security uh, and some of the issues that I think will face uh, the next administration. Uh, before I do that, I did want to uh, go even further afield in, into dangerous territory by remarking on one thing that uh, that was spoken of at the last panel, which I thought was a fascinating panel, the panel on rendition. And um, uh, in the panel, uh, a number of the uh, commentators uh, bemoaned, I think, the lack of congressional oversight. And uh, I, if I can characterize it perhaps a bit unfairly, the consensus was that Congress lacked the uh, stomach for engaging in difficult issues relating to rendition. Uh, that may be the case in the national security realm but what I see in the homeland security realm, and it was an interesting contrast, and I just thought I'd, I'd share it with you, is kind of the exact opposite, which is Congress is too much engaged and too unreasonably so. Um, we call it the anti-Horton principle, and that's not Willie Horton. That's uh, Horton the elephant. You, know, you remember him? He said, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. This elephant's faithful 100%. What Congress does is 
it says something that it doesn't mean, and it doesn't mean what it says in the Homeland Security area all the time. Um, I was thinking about this today uh, as I was reading about congressional uh, members who were objecting to the secretary exercising his waiver authority uh, of environmental laws to permit the construction of a border fence down on the southwest border. Now, the department had opposed the mandate to build a hard uh, fence on the border, uh, but nonetheless, Congress went forward and told us we must build 670 miles of it, and we must build that before the end of this year, and we give you the authority to waive uh, environmental laws so that you may expedite the construction of this, uh, of this fence. And when we go ahead and actually do that, uh, the same congressman, I mean, there are actually members on the brief uh, in opposition to the waiver who signed, who were sponsors of the law authorizing the exemption. Uh, uh, they, they oppose it. Uh, uh, another really in today's world example that I thought I'd share is uh, back in uh, August of last year, Congress directed us uh, again over our objections to begin a program to screen 100% of the air cargo traveling in airplanes uh, for uh, bombs and radiological material. Uh, we had been doing a program that uh, targeted screening on high-risk packages, uh, uh, applying our resources in a way that we thought was actually more risk-based, risk-allocated, and, and, and use less of your money on needless things. Um, but Congress said, no, no, you got to do this 100%. So the other day, uh, Transportation Security Administration announced the plans that we're going to actually do this, and here's how it's going to happen. And it, by the way, it's going to cost a lot of money, and people are going to be you know, it's going to require packages to be shipped more readily, more early. And lo and behold, now the exact same congressmen are thinking of repealing uh, that provision because they said they want security, but they don't mean it. Um, so my view of Congress, uh, you know, just before I get to the, the meat of what I say, is not that they lack the stomach for it, but that they sometimes lack a seriousness of purpose uh, or, more fundamentally, an understanding of how hard it is to actually do some of the things that they demand the U.S. government do, uh, which makes our job in the executive branch uh, exceedingly difficult and challenging. But that's not what I came to talk about today. Um, uh, I did, what I did want to talk about today is what I consider the core domain of the department, uh, its mission to protect the homeland. And I want to talk about what I think I see going forward as the Department of Homeland Security transitions from this administration to the next administration of whatever political type or flavor that might be. And that transition is going to be the transition that we're in the midst of here from what is now, by and large, a purely defensive organization. Uh, our strategic objectives are stated in a very defensive way. We are intending to keep bad people and bad things out of the country, right? We're in a defensive crowd. It's going to transition the department into one that actually plays offense and participates with the intelligence communities, with the national se security, with the Department of Defense in the active disruption of terrorist networks and the active frustration of their aims. Now, where will our efforts lie? Uh, well, as I kind of survey uh, America's efforts against terrorism uh, more broadly throughout the U.S. government, I see many successes in other portions of the government. Our co my colleagues in the Department of Treasury have made great strides in disrupting terrorist financing. Uh, it's not by, it's by no means completely solved, but by and large, it is much harder to transfer money electrically around the world today unknown. And that means that for terrorists, it's a much more dangerous thing to transfer that money throughout the world. Similarly, um, our colleagues at the NSA and at the other intelligence agencies have done a great deal to disrupt communications uh, between terrorists, uh, whether from the Fatah back to the homeland or from Europe to here. And even though the terrorists continue to develop innovative communication techniques, the um, most recent one I read about uh, publicly was the use of draft dead drop emails on web servers, which is a pr pretty neat kind of thing, we've still put a crimp in that as well. And what we've seen in response is an increase in the personal travel of terrorists, the actual physical movement of terrorists around the globe, both to communicate 
communicate as messengers, bringing messages by hand or you know, in, in their brains, and to carry funds. There's been a significant uptick in bulk cash courier smuggling internationally. Now, of course, a lot of that is probably not terrorist related. It's drug money moving, moving around the world and such like. But it is fundamentally uh, a change in operational patterns. And so what I'd like to talk about fundamentally today is our effort to target those terrorists who are now moving around the country and around the world. And more particularly, um, how we are working just nascently now, and I think more in the next administration, to make it as hard for terrorists to travel physically as it has already become for them to move money and people around the globe. Um, and so I want to discuss both the power of the data availability that allows us to target terrorists, and I also want to talk candidly about some of the perils that I think lie behind uh, this new paradigm. Uh, to start, let me illustrate the power of what we're doing uh, with a story. Uh, it's the story of a man named Raid Albania. Uh, a few of you may have heard of it because there are very few of these stories that we can actually publicly, uh, publicly disclose for, for obvious security reasons, but you'll see why this one is in the public domain. Albania arrived at the Chicago O'Hare Airport back in 2003. Based upon linked information in our databases, uh, he was referred for what we call secondary screening, and some of you may have experienced that. That's where you go to the CBP officer, you give him your passport, and instead of going to pick up your bags and get out of the airport, he says, would you please go over there and talk to one of our officers? The officer may look in your bags, he will ask you some questions, that sort of thing. Um, based upon what occurred in the secondary screening, Albania was uh, denied entry to the United States at O'Hare. Um, at the time, his fingerprints and his photograph were taken, and he was sent to return back to London uh, from whence he had originated. Uh, now, to be honest, at the time, the officer had no cold, hard facts of the sort that would uh, justify a detention, an arrest of any sort. Um, but he had sufficient indications of concern to exercise his authority, and he has it. It's, not, it's delegated all the way down to our officers to deny Albany entry. Well, the next time those fingerprints were found, uh, they were on the steering wheel of a suicide car uh, that had blown itself up in a market in Iraq, killing 130 people. Uh, Al-Qaeda uh, published a, uh, one of its uh, martyrdom uh, uh, videos, you know, lauding Albania's activity. Uh, do we know what Albania's intentions were coming into O'Hare? Of course not. Nobody knows. Maybe he was just here on vacation. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, you know, one wonders about uh, what his intentions were, and one thinks of this as a success for this sort of system. What identified Albania is something we call the automated targeting system. It's been in the news a little, but it's one that's generally unfamiliar to most Americans. ATS is a rules-based system that uses inputs from a variety of sources to target CBP, Customs and Border Protection, inspection resources at travelers who are perceived or to be high risk. What are some of the sources of information that come into this? Um, the national, the NCIC, the National Criminal uh, Information Center, wants and warrants of who's, uh, who there are lookouts for, including wants and warrants from overseas, from Interpol. It includes current intelligence and threats uh, from a variety of sources, uh, identifying perhaps recently discovered passport fraud, uh, 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 that uh, has been discovered by the intelligence or particular routes of concern that are identified based upon you know, sources and methods that I don't even know anything about, thank God. Um, it contains as well our biographic information on people who are on, in the terrorist screening watch list that's held by the terrorist screening center, which is operated by the FBI and the Department of Justice. It also contains information about the individual traveler both what we call advanced passenger information, that is the passport data on your passport page, name, gender, uh, country of, of nationality, passport number, and uh, what we call passenger name record information, PNR. Uh, PNR is commercial data that a traveler gives to the airline in advance of travel, and besides the name and itinerary, it can include things like who your travel agent is, who you're traveling with, 
um, what your phone number is, what your credit card is. Now, the biographic information allows us to identify for targeting people whose names are similar to or identical to people on the terrorist screening watch list, people or people who are in the NCIC and are, are known or suspected of being criminals. The passenger name record information serves a different function. It allows us through link analysis to actually link people who might otherwise be on that list to, to uh, unknown individuals. The greatest threat that we, fa we face uh, uh, in defending the border, and I would think probably in the intelligence community, is not the people we know about. It's the people we don't know about yet, the clean skins, they're called, the unknowns. What we use are things like phone numbers or traveling companions to link people who are known or suspected of being terrorists or affiliated with terrorist organizations to their travel companions. So for example, if I'm traveling, uh, and I give as a reference phone number, a phone number that a, uh, the FBI has identified in one of its uh, wiretaps to be used by a money launderer here in the United States who's suspected of terrorist uh, connections, then that link pops out of the ATS and I, I, I don't get arrested, it's not, you know, it's not that kind of targeting, but I will be asked additional questions upon entry into the United States. So it's an extremely powerful tool because it allows us to pull out from the mass of data um, things that we don't know about. Let me give you two more examples just so that you can sort of understand uh, where we're coming from. Uh, using this targeting system, we broke a uh, drug smuggling ring involving corrupt uh, ticketing agents. Uh, an average American citizen like me would show up at an airport overseas and check two bags. Say I'm with my wife and my kids and our family, we check three, four bags. We take our uh, tickets and leave, and then the corrupt ticket agent behind the counter would, five minutes later, add another bag to our ticketing queue, right? He'd take it from behind the desk and add it and say that Paul Rosenzweig's traveling with it, right? So I, get, uh, I arrive here in Dulles, and that's great. I go catch my three bags, and me, my wife, and my family, we leave. And meanwhile, his agent, uh, his confederate here in America, pulls the extra bag out off of the, off of the uh, carousel and takes it off and wham, we've smuggled drugs into the United States. Now obviously this exact same method is useful for smuggling any, any item or good, whether it's um, a, a small nuke or a, a suitcase nuke, so to speak, or a biological weapon or any item of, of contraband. Now that's a targeting rule, right? The addition of extra bags after check-in is a target rule that targets those bags for secondary inspection. Does it catch everything? No. But it's an additional idea uh, about what we can look at that allows us to identify an unknown, the corrupt ticketing agent, rather than the known terrorist. One more example, and then I promise I will turn to the perils of this, of this system as well, since I'm not insensitive to them. But one other example was uh, uh, identified by a rather astute uh, analyst of ours who noticed that a, a woman uh, was traveling, had traveled from Miami uh, to the Dominican Republic alone, and had returned from the Dominican Republic with her three children. Uh, now, on the face of it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The kids might have been visiting their parents, they might have gone down with dad, come back with mom, any number of innocent explanations for that. But it was sufficiently unusual that he examined the travel of this particular woman and found that over the prior six months she'd done the exact same thing uh, on five or six different occasions and each time returned with different children. She was smuggling children into the United States for uh, a sexual exploitation network. Um, and once you see that pattern there, you can throw that pattern at other people and she was part of a ring of eight or ten different people who were doing this using this technique of tradecraft for smuggling children into the United States uh, in violation of our immigration laws and for what I'm sure everybody will agree are, are pretty horrible uh, purposes. So this has a lot of power. Uh, it is an effective tool. What are its dangers? Well, there are, there are a number of them that are obvious. The one that most people talk about is, of course, the risk of a false positive, that you will be identified uh, for uh, screening when you ought not to be. Now, that's a real risk. 
Uh, there is a lack of fidelity in the data uh, that is not, does not allow us to decisively identify each individual uniquely. In the international context where we use this program, however, that risk is very much diminished because invariably people traveling internationally have not just a, a name but a unique identification number that goes with them, their passport number. And so those two pieces of data greatly heighten the fidelity of our ability to identify and make sure that the person we are asking to come for secondary screening is in fact uh, the person who we intend to ask and not a confusion between two Teddy Kennedys or, you know, or, or, or that sort of thing. Um, a second complaint about this is that it uses what some would consider to be personal data. It uses your credit card number or your uh, telephone number or who you're traveling with as a part of the link analysis that adds people together. I confess I have had a lot of trouble figuring that one out because um, this is data that is willingly provided in a uh, in, in a commercial context to the airlines. It is data that is by and large known. Uh, I can get, uh, anybody can get your phone number, Scott, off of Google, um, you know, with two clicks pretty much. Uh, it is something that we are concerned about and, it is, and it, it is one that we've had an extended discussion, particularly with our friends in the European Union about. To deal with that, we've instituted a large number of privacy protective measures relating to access control, auditing the use of this. Uh, we're going to actually be hosting later this year a bunch of Europeans who are going to come over and, and basically check our homework to see that we're doing this uh, well. Um, data retention policies. And of course, the most significant protection here is that we've, got, we've done a real use limitation on this data. This data is used principally uh, not for arrest, or you know, or you know, shooting on site. It's used to direct somebody off for additional scrutiny, which, though annoying, is a much less significant intrusion in liberty than one than, for example, say, arrest. Uh, what I think, it, and now, and now, this is where I've really, I'm really going off script because uh, to date we've been. Uh, this is the system as is. It's going to get bigger going forward. The European Union it was so uh, in, uh, impressed by the concept and its power that the Council has proposed the development of a, of a European-wide PNR uh, automated targeting system as well, which uh, if the Council agrees will come online in three to five years. Uh, the uh, Spanish government has, has passed a law, the Danish government has passed a law requiring it domestically for their countries. We are seeing this type of targeting system for identifying the unknowns propagate throughout the world. So now let me go completely off, uh, off the reservation and tell you about what I really think are the dangers of this sort of pervasive um, uh, data availability. Um, the first is that the information we get comes without context. Uh, and information without context is not knowledge. It gives us the data point that somebody has had a criminal conviction or, uh, or is on somebody's watch list, but it tells us very often not anything about why. So we don't see a distinction in the data between the person whose criminal record is for a uh, minor uh, drug offense back in his home country uh, 10 years ago and after which he's led a clean life or a drug offense that is today you know, a major felony involving a massive drug trafficking operation. We don't see a distinction between a connection uh, to terrorist organizations that are as tenuous uh, or one that is, is known and certain within the intelligence community. The fidelity of the data uh, and, and is not clear. What this has suggested to me is that the data that we use right now requires annotation in some form. Uh, and that actually scares people because what it suggests to me is we need more data, even more data to understand what the data is that we're looking at that is forming the basis for our targeting decisions. And that's going to be particularly important, of course, as this pervasive data ability migrates not outside of the governmental sphere 
uh, into the commercial sphere. There are companies like Choice Point out there who collect this data and sell it for a price. You can buy an entire data file of every criminal conviction in the United States for about a thousand bucks from Choice Point today. And none of that data is annotated. And yet people will make hiring decisions on the basis of that. People will make um, uh, 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 residence decisions about who can be permitted to live where. Uh, all those sorts of things, all without annotation. So that's information needs context. And without context, it really isn't usable knowledge. That's one of the dangers going forward. A second um, a problem that I see going forward is the structure of our databases doesn't match uh, what we're doing in a sophisticated way. Right now, the idea is that we have a database and you can throw a question at it. Do you have any Joe Smiths? Do you know any uh, Scott Silmans? Anything like that. And the answer will come back, no, I don't know that. But the truth of the matter is, is that data is getting added to the database every day. So the only way for me to make sure that Scott Stillman is not a problem tomorrow is to ask that question every day. Got any Scots today? Got any Scots tomorrow? Got any Scots the next day? And that means that for it to operate, the system has to ask questions about everybody every day, which is fundamentally uh, anti-privacy. It, it's asking questions about every name we could possibly conceive of. What we need to do in both, again, in the federal government and in the commercial data sphere is reconfigure the databases so that every addition to the database is itself a query. Every, data, every piece of data a query, every query a data point. If I ask, do you know any Scots, right, uh, that resides not as just a query, but as a data point that somebody out there, an analyst, has a good reason to be interested in Scott. So if six years later, or six weeks later, data comes in, that matches up to the query. So that I don't have to be asking the same question every day in a privacy invasive way. And it, it, there's no adverse privacy or fewer adverse privacy consequences. The third one, which is perhaps the, um, uh, the, the last one I will leave you with, is that the pervasiveness of information and our ability to access it is wildly increasing uh, the certainty of punishment, right? It is raising my ability as the federal government to identify uh, criminal uh, traffickers uh, in, in children uh, to our, our great good, but it's also magnifying my ability to identify people who are committing other offenses that might not necessarily be thought of as so serious, smuggling Cuban cigars, for example. Um, our deterrence model in the entire criminal sphere is based upon uh, a, uh, an assessment of the likelihood of capture, right? We punish people uh, 10 years for X offense because we figure we're only going to, to catch 5% you know, of them at, some, at one point or another. And so we set a very high criminal penalty rate because our rate of capture and conviction is so low. As information grows in availability, and the certainty of punishment grows, um, there's two things that we might want to think about, and I'll leave this with you. One is, should we be reducing the amount of time that we, uh, uh, criminal time, that uh, uh, given offenses get, because you're more certain to be captured, so you know, one side of the equation goes down, maybe the punishment side goes up, the punishment side should go down. And the, la and the last thing is, if we can know everything that you do, uh, and, and define what's, and know when you've done something wrong, do we need to stop making everything wrong. Uh, you know, we can catch everybody now who's smuggling Cuban cigars and know about it for forever. Does that mean that we should maybe rethink what we consider criminal offenses as opposed to civil offenses, administrative offenses? They don't have to be completely ignored, but the characterization of them as criminal uh, leaves a lot to be desired in a system where I know a great deal more, I, the US government, not I, me, personally. We, I know a great deal more. We know a great deal more about everybody. So that's a short tour through what I see going forward. Uh, it's a tour in which I see the Department of Homeland Security taking the offense against terrorists. The program I've described is but one of a few. I could rattle on about fingerprint taking at the, at the airports or, uh, or uh, identification requirements at the border, improving passport security. But I think I've probably rattled on more than long enough. Uh, the next administration is going to have to figure out a lot of these questions 
as it goes forward. What are the rules for engagement? How are we going to integrate with our international partners? Do we want to integrate with them? Uh, that would have some great benefits for creating a space of safety that is broader than just America, but it also has some great um, uh, challenges in bringing together systems that are not necessarily uh, perfectly aligned both in law or in culture. Uh, it's going to be a great challenge. Uh, my job ends in nine months and some number of days, so I'm going to leave it to somebody else. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to answering your questions. We, we have about uh, 10 minutes, so, uh, and he has agreed to answer some questions. So, If you could speak as loudly as you could. Okay. Um, I'm so glad you raised this issue because um, I, I always try to you know, look at the larger political climate and the, and the, and the behaviors that go on. And, and, you know, I have this theory that a lot of stuff happens in political culture because of emotional blackmail. And I, I, I bring that up because uh, one of the things that's really puzzling me about, uh, you know, a federal, uh, you know, surveillance is one, it's, 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 it is partisan. What <laughs> it seems to be that, you know, because there are these political wranglings and, you know, this culture of vendetta culture, it, it, it creates even a more vulnerable uh, situation for disfavored minorities. And uh, you know, uh, with uh, you know, if, if, a, if a particular federal person has a bias or has you know some prejudice particularly towards another, it, it, it breaks the ante. So I'm wondering what how you would deal with how do you how do you deal with I will repeat the question. Summarize the question, which was basically, um, do I uh, do I perceive and how do we deal with bias? Uh, within the system that is biased in particular against racial minorities, um, uh, presumably, you mean in this instance, mostly people of Arab descent uh, who are, or Muslim descent who are the subject matter. I have to tell you, it's, it's actually kind of interesting. If I could characterize the, uh, the thinking in the department, um, I would say that the places that we perceive the greatest risk from are not necessarily the places you would expect uh, when, uh, when Secretary Chertoff talks about emerging threats to the homeland, um, he doesn't talk necessarily about the Middle East or South Asia. Um, he talks often about Southeast Asia. And uh, forgive me, Richard, but you know, my friend Richard Gerding, he is here. He's from the, from the Netherlands Embassy in Washington. Um, but he often talks about the emerging threats from Europe uh, and the development of homegrown uh, terrorists there. Um, one thing I can assure you of, and I know this because I, I, we helped to build the system, is that the targeting system, at least the one I was talking about today, uh, has absolutely no mention of uh, race or ethnicity or, um, or any of those suspect characteristics. The intelligence that it uses is a great deal more focused. It's, you know, this particular flight or this particular series of flights during this particular time frame. Um, that sort of targeting. Uh, and so, from my perspective, it's actually an improvement over uh, the broad-based prejudices that have and, and could easily continue to animate individuals for forever because it allows us to um, have a pretty rigorous uh, check on who we pull aside for secondary screening and why. Uh, it's not perfect. You know, uh, we have 200 and 10,000 people who work for the DHS, and I, I would be lying if I told you that they were all uh, saints, uh, but, um, but it, it does give us a really solid grounding. It's auditable, so we know if people are putting in uh, invidious uh, test characteristics, you know, give me all the Pakistanis or, you know, something like that, and, and by and large, we don't see that, and, and, and so we're pretty pleased with ourselves in that regard. Uh, how are you? Ball. It's good well, to see you. Welcome to do. A softball, please, Dave? Yeah. No, not from David. Uh, David used to be my oversight guy. <laughs> well, I'm not going to comment on your the oversight. You made a lot of good points on oversight, but uh, they, they weren't entirely balanced, but I'm not going to answer <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and, uh, but thank you for discarding the staff speech, because you did give us a lot of uh, food for thought there. I wonder if you could opine a little bit on uh, 
you know, as used in the context of immigration, you, uh, you know, the context of entry into the United States, uh, you know, there's one set of legal analysis and balancing of policies that you would make. But as this system, this, which can, has many numerous applications, as it could potentially migrate to citizens, how do you think about that in terms of what types of additional limitations on its use might be required uh, and why? And uh, also, how do you uh, uh, ensure against, and when Scott and I teach and we talk to students about things like this, one of the things they certainly bring up is mission creep. Absolutely. Uh, how do you ensure that this, uh, which is a counterterrorism tool and maybe an anti-child trafficking tool, how do you make sure we're not trying to stop travel of uh, protesters who want to go to San Francisco to, to put out the torch? Well. Uh there, there are a couple pieces I I invested in that. The first is um, the transition from a, an international arrivals program to a domestic arrivals program. Um, I, my own view uh, is that the only way to do that, to, to guard against that, is to really have a hard line and police it. Uh, the things that we do in this system with respect to arriving non-citizens are things that I don't think anybody wants us to do uh, with respect to uh, domestic travelers. Uh, it, it's just, um, it's a, it would be a, a significant challenge. Uh, what, but the truth is that it, to some degree, uh, these sorts of systems are mutating into the domestic system. There's a program we're running called Secure Flight, uh, which is going to be just a biographic watch list check. So this is none of the uh, finding the unknowns, it's only finding the knowns who, whose names are on the terror screening watch list who might be traveling domestically, who might have uh, surreptitiously crossed the southern border or, um, or something of that sort. Uh, and there we have to be much more careful. For those who followed the evolution of that program, when it was first proposed uh, under, uh, before I got uh, engaged in this, before I even joined the department, it was conceived of in much the same way as a kind of uh, omnibus, find everybody for everything program. Um, I thought that that was terrible when I was on the outside of the government for many of the same reasons that I'm sure you do. Uh, what it is now, uh, again, I think a much better mutation is a name and a date of birth. And that's it uh, as an identifier. Again, one name and a unique identification number, which will resolve about 98 to 99% of the false positives and not request of anybody uh, in America uh, data that is, well, I mean, there's some people who think that their birth date is an exceedingly private and, and um, uh, item, but by and large, I think the, the, even the privacy community that who are generally very critical of our activities have, have thought that that's a real reduction in the data call uh, and, and, uh, and again, reduction in the consequences. So it's just, uh, you know, could we ask you some questions just to make sure you're not who you say you are? Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, uh, there's a real prospect of uh, expansion of that program. Uh, not, I think, necessarily because of uh, stringent congressional oversight, though here in drawing lines about programs, Congress is pretty good on yes-no questions, do or don't do. But more particularly, I, I think, because of people like the New York Times or, or the privacy uh, oversight groups, uh, EPIC and uh, ACLU, uh, who uh, I think it was uh, Michael Kinsley in Slate who called them the canary in the mine shaft. And they will scream bloody murder if uh, I or our successors try and mutate this program too far. And rightly so, I think. We have time for. One more. There is one. Just one last question. If you could speak as loudly as you could. You talked about how um, every query would become a data point uh, that is a goal. Then how do you how do you decide on what query to put? So that, in other words, if it becomes a data point, just that you ask a question about somebody and the person is entirely innocent but then the next time the name is checked well there's a data point already um, well that that that's a question um 
it, it actually sort of requires me to get a, a bit into systems analysis. Uh, the, 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 the question is a query point, but you can design it so well, for a number of things. You can design it so that the queries age out over time, right? Uh, so if there's no, been no answer for uh, 10 years it, it, or five years. On the other hand, you don't want to lean too hard on that because a query, to, you know, a query in 1997, uh, what about Muhammad Atta, right? You would want not to have aged out by 2001. Uh, so you have to worry about that. I think that the real answer to that is not in restricting the asking of the questions, but in restricting what gets answered back. So that we don't get answered back, um, you know, Atta is a Chinese uh, pro-Tibetan protester, but we only get answered back, um, Atta is now on the CIA watch list because of his name was on a computer in Pakistan, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and that requires, uh, you know, honestly, a lot of insight and oversight of how the system is run. Uh, and that's a great challenge, uh, but, uh, you know, because every system like this that I've ever seen breaks down at some point. There's always play in the, in the joints. There are people who abuse it because they're venal. There are people who misuse it because they're just idiots. Um, that's the way of the world. But the only other alternative is not to do it at all. And the, the logical construct of that would be the same, would, would drive you as well to not arming police officers, right? There are police officers who misuse their guns and weapons uh, to kill the you know, boyfriend of their wife, you know, their, their, or uh, fire stupidly uh, because they are racist pigs or, or uh, they've made mistakes. But that, the only real way to fight that isn't to disarm the police because we have such positive gains from that in terms of public safety. It's hire the right people, right? Train them well, uh, use strong administrative internal and external controls as best you can uh, to crank down when they do th something stupid through internal affairs bureaus and then through oversight by the city council. Uh, that's an imperfect system. But people who want a perfect system want no system. And, and at least in this, time frame with this kind of threat, I don't think that's, a, that's a, a, an answer we can afford. Well, uh, I know they might not, but you flew down this morning just to give the speech, and Stuart is calling you back up, uh, so he's going to have to fly back to Washington uh, very, very quickly. But we really appreciate your giving us your views, looking forward from Homeland Security, uh, and as David said, a lot of issues for us to think about. But Paul, thank you for coming down. Thank you very much. We are going to reconvene back in Janine Auditorium as close to, uh, Admiral Miller would tell me, as close to uh, 2.15 as we can uh, for the final panel on the role of the lawyer in the war on terrorism. Thank you for joining us at lunch.